Thank you for tuning in once again to Perk Up with the President. And I'm Dr. Howard Spearman, and we are going to talk a little bit about persistence, enrollment, retention, completion from the lens of a faculty member. And today we have Professor Suzanne Miller here. And I'm going to have Suzanne speak to us first in, in the form of an introduction so she can share with us what she teaches, uh, some of the things maybe she loves about her uh, teaching, and then from there we will simply engage one another in a coffee chat style conversation. Suzanne, thank you for coming. Appreciate having you here. Feel free to introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you for having me. This is really exciting. Um, as Dr. Spearman mentioned, my name is Suzanne Miller. I'm an instructor in the sociology department here at Rock Valley College. Um, I've been teaching for 10 years, although I did just recently, about a year ago, start teaching full time here at Rock Valley. And so um, what really, I feel like I feel like I probably drank a little bit of the Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> what, really, what really keeps me in the classroom is the student engagement. It is always so fun, uh, whether I'm teaching an intro class or a race and ethnic relations class, to watch the students have their own aha moments. And probably one of my favorite things to have happen is when they are able to make connections that maybe I haven't thought of before. That's when I know that we're learning stuff. So that's really fun. That's my favorite. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And you started outside of the classroom. You started down the student services path. Mm -hmm. So speak to us a little bit about the student service experience that you've had, some of the areas you've uh, worked in, and then how did you literally take that experience and move into the classroom? Sure. Um, so I've got... Uh, 20 years, I shouldn't be able to say that. <laughs> I have 20 years of higher ed experience under my belt now. And it started, I started as a part-time evening admin at Stintrum Center. That was my very first job in higher education. And I worked in the technical programs. Um, and my, my main duties uh, surrounded support of students and faculty who were teaching evening classes. So those folks in the automotive program, welding program, it was amazing. I loved everything about that job. Um, at one point an opportunity opened up on main campus in the testing center and I interviewed for the job and uh, they offered the job but then the Dean called me into her office and said you can have this job but we kind of want you to do this. And so they created a full-time position at the Stenstrom Center uh, I like to say for me, but really it's for the students, right? Where, where we really needed to, the enrollment was growing there and we needed some student support services there. And so my goal in the student support office that was created was to get those services out there. And so I started um, a lot of data collecting and conversations with staff, faculty, and students alike to figure out what we needed. And so I'm really proud of the fact that I had a hand in setting up uh, the advising, the tutoring, the student life programming that, that started at Stenstrom. Um, from there, I got this wild idea in my head to go back to grad school. So <laughs> right at the beginning of the recession in 2008, I quit my awesome full-time job with benefits and went down to U of I to get my, my master's in social work and totally thought I wanted to do a social work you know, career right up until my internship. <laughs> and I realized that wasn't really a good fit. My mentors in the program kind of helped guided me on what I was really looking for, which was, I, I've always been a sociologist. I just never put that label to it, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I was fortunate enough that right as I was graduating, Rock Valley, under the leadership of Dr. Becker, um, decided to open up a downtown campus. And I read that job description and I was like, this is, they wrote this for me. This is my job. So I applied and it was a very extensive interview process. Um, at one point there was an interview with, I, it was something like 30 people in the room. Um, they really wanted to make sure they got the right fit. And I was fortunate enough to receive that position. So I came back to Rock Valley. My second iteration started in 2010, which is when we met. 
Um, and for four years, I got to be the, um, the director of the Learning and Opportunity Center, which was our first iteration for the downtown campus. From there, I did transition up to Wisconsin for a little bit. I served as a, as a retention advisor at Black Hawk Tech Community, or T Black Hawk Tech College, and then transitioned to Highland Community College as their career services coordinator. And during the space of that time, I was teaching the whole time. Um, and I actually blame Dr. Pyer for that. <laughs> uh, be, during his first uh, tenureship here, he, he worked very hard to develop our first round of student development programming courses, right? And so he was looking for instructors and, and relying somewhat heavily, I think, on student service staff, and I, I wanted in. And I'll never forget my first session in the classroom. And I was like, this, this is what I'm supposed to do. The, the, I know I just got that really great degree, <laughs> but this is what I'm supposed to do. And I haven't stopped since. And so I've, I, the last couple years, I was really looking at transitioning into full-time teaching. Um, and I wanted to teach sociology. So I had to go back and get that degree. And so I did. And I waited for the opportunity. And, and then it came. And so I was able to kind of come back home. I grew up at Rock Valley. So this institution is very near and dear to my heart. I've been connected to this college in some way, shape, or form ever since I was a little girl. Hmm. So the ever since I was a little girl part, I was not aware of. So, but thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. What's clear is you've always maintained, and I know this because I've also had a chance to work with you. Like when you came back in 2010, I started in 2011, and we worked close uh, together in those various roles. Mm -hmm. um, but student engagement has always been a, a place of passion, and it's natural for you. Um, you've always had that sense of connection with students, rolling out the red carpet. Students always used to uh, say how they had a wonderful experience talking to you and things of that nature. So how do you take that same level of student engagement, that same level of passion outside of the classroom and bring it into the classroom? I mean, I am who I am, right? <laughs> and so, and sometimes you just can't bridle it you know when you when you are passionate about something it's everywhere you're going to find that passion and so whether I'm in the classroom or out of the classroom at the end of the day my goal is to help students reach their educational goal and if I can get them to view their world experiences in a different way all the better right and so the, the, way, the way that you do that is you meet, we talk about this so much in higher education, you meet the student with where they're at. And in those interactions with students, I, I work to be authentically engaged with them. And as long as you can be authentic, whether you get it right or you get it wrong, they're going to come back for more. And once you have that rapport, you can increase that engagement, right? You can increase that passion. So I think just if, if there's one word that I could use to answer that question, it would be authenticity. I mean, that's, that's how you bring the engagement into the classroom. Wow, I love that. I love that. Uh, my, my dissertation was on the role of spirituality in academic advising. Hmm. Okay. And so in exploring what that meant, I was able to interview various academic advisors and how they felt they employ their spirituality? How do they use it on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, how is it real for them? And one of the ways that they mentioned was really being authentic, being them their authentic selves, but also allowing space for the student to be as authentic, as unique as that student wants to be. So what's your, what's your take on that? I would agree with that 100%. Um, I think one thing that we struggle with in academia is um, kind of having, and maybe I shouldn't speak for all of everyone, right? <laughs> but I think oftentimes there is this, 
this concept that, okay, we have these learning outcomes that we need to achieve, we have these points that we want the students to walk away with, and we're just going to work and work and kind of shove this information at them until we feel like they have it, right? Maybe that's not the goal of education, though. Maybe the goal should be the student is coming to the table to learn something specific for themselves, whether that is personal or career-based or spiritually based. And, and the takeaway is just the takeaway. What, you know, what would education look like if we were happy with that? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I agree. And one thing we know, you know, sticking with the, what you're saying is you're, as a faculty member, you're providing a space for self-exploration. You're, you're providing a space for the student to discover who they are in the classroom and through your curriculum and through your learning style. And I think that is meaningful because students have to walk on this campus and feel connected. They have to feel a sense of identity. And so how do you, do you feel that you have a better opportunity to help students gain a sense of identity when you're in front of the classroom teaching or when you were in your student services various roles? I don't think it's an either or. I, you know, I think, um, I think for every opportunity that I've had, it's, it's just different. It's just a different opportunity to let the student experience whatever it is they need to experience. Um, the work can kind of look a little different. Obviously, you know, meeting with someone who is undecided as a career services staff person and going through that process is very different than trying to teach theory in mm -hmm. the classroom, right? But I don't think, yeah, I'll just say, I, I don't think that one is maybe more effective than the other or better than the other. I just think that it is, the student is coming to you with a specific goal. And even if you don't accomplish the goal in that moment or in that semester, you ideally, I would hope that I've laid the foundation for them to achieve that goal at some point. Right. Absolutely. And that's what you're speaking to also is the holistic approach to learning, right? Uh, we are all privileged to be a part of the student's journey. Mm -hmm. And no matter where that student's at, we influence their journey. We, we influence their self-discovery, mm -hmm. their self-exploration, their self-identity, but we also influence their overall student success, right? Inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to understand that from our various perspectives. So. As we're talking through some of this, I, you know, I, I use the terms perk up, persistence, enrollment, retention, completion, right? It's uh, something that, you know, I think is catchy because, you know, perk up and you got your coffee and all that, great. But realistically, when you think about perk up from your faculty lens, when you think about those different terms, which one of the four really stands out to you and how do you feel you impact that term in your classroom? So probably completion. And I know oftentimes when you talk about completion, we're talking about a student being able to attain their educational goal, right? In the classroom though, at the course level, when we talk about completion, we have to, we have to put it into these smaller chunks. I believe when we are working with students because sometimes completion is an assignment you know it is a learning outcome um, and, and maybe for the student in that moment the big picture is just completion of that course so how do I help them complete that piece of their educational goal mm -hmm. right um,
I try to personalize the experience for the student so as much as possible, which can get difficult <laughs> when you have, you know, a couple hundred that you're working with. <laughs> um, but what that means is that there has to be some flexibility when you are in the classroom. There has to be empathy and, you know, sometimes some grace when you are in the classroom because there are so many different variables being brought to the table. So if, if my goal in giving an assignment is for a student to be able to apply a certain concept and they didn't meet that goal, um, do I allow them to redo the assignment because I see the value in them meeting that particular outcome? Or does the grade stand as it is and maybe we take a different approach with a different assignment? Right? It's, it's, it's kind of a, a variant on the stretch model, model that was all the rage a few years back uh, where everyone may start at the same point and everyone ends at the same point, but how they get there could vary from student to student, right? And so that's, that's something that I'm kind of playing with in my class right now so that students are still able to complete and they've still met the outcomes that, that I would like for them to have, but, but maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't match up with my lesson plan along the way, right? So are you suggesting that you are, regardless of what's on your syllabus, you don't necessarily treat every student exactly the same because you have to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And the goal is that they all get to the same end goal of completion. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So the other question I wanna ask you, and in your words, what's a sociologist? We'd be doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so in my own words, a sociologist is somebody who studies human behavior in the context of society. But more important to me personally, my approach focuses more on the systems at play, so it's a more macro level um, study of society, and then um, that symbiotic relationship between the folks in the society and the structures that exist within that society, right? And so um, the last year or so, mm -hmm. while traumatic, has been a playground for me <laughs> as I watch all of this nonsense or crisis or just, you know, social phenomena, like whatever label you want to put on it. As I have watched all of it unfold, I've already written lectures that I anticipate I'll give 10 years from now. <laughs> like that, that was something that I did when we first transitioned to working at home. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, you know. Um, so, and, and the reason why I find it so fascinating, and this is, this kind of goes back to when I was in my internship for my social work program, um, the, the person who mentored me through that process asked me how I didn't catch it before we got to that point in the educational process because for every, for every psychological theory that we studied, for every case study that we went over, for every patient um, file that I reviewed when I was in my internship, I was going to work as a healthcare social worker. That was my goal. So, ev you know, every time we would look at something, my first response was never a possible solution. My first response was always, why? Mm. Why is this like this? Well, why do we do it that way? Well, why is the system set up that way? Well, why do we expect the patient to respond that way? And, and for me, and that's what I tell my students all the time. Unfortunately, we have socialized people to sit and get information, right? Um, it, is, it is not a norm within our society to challenge those that are in perceived or actual roles of authority. 
when you come into my classroom, if I say something and you and your your knee jerk reaction is, but why? Mm -hmm. Verbalize that, please, <laughs> so that we can examine this from different theoretical perspectives, because that is the goal of sociology. We need to take what we perceive to be personal and look at it from a macro standpoint, from that 20,000 foot bird's eye view, right? And once we start to do that, we can have a better understanding of why people behave the way they do, why systems, um, structures, institutions exist in the form that they do within our society. I could go on forever, <laughs> Dr. Spearman. <laughs> so <laughs> as, you were, as you were speaking, what I was thinking about, I was thinking about taking advantage of our RVC tuition waiver for employees and enrolling in your class. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it. The more the merrier. The more the merrier. I'm on board. <laughs> so how do you, do you find yourself, I mean, if I was in your class, if I was your student, I would be engaged. I, I would be talking to you. I would be asking you questions. Uh, do you find yourself in front of the classroom having these in-depth conversations with students or do you find yourself having to pull some of this out of the students? A little bit of both. So what's really cool is that you never know what you're walking into. Every class is different and every session for that class is different. So <clears throat> some, some classes that I have I have to work a little harder to get them to open up and engage. Um, others, I have to work really hard to slow them down, to pull them back a little bit. <laughs> you know, I, I, I almost hesitate to say it, but really kind of shut them down sometimes mm -hmm. because they're so engaged. Um, it just depends on, on that particular group of students. I really try to set the tone within the first couple weeks of class expectation. And I am very clear on day one that <clears throat> while there will be some lecture and we'll throw in some videos and I'll use the whiteboard, you know, all the stuff that teachers are supposed to do, <laughs> um, my hope is that this is a discussion-based class because I really want to break them free of the sit and get model. I want them to engage critically, and, and it breaks my heart when they are scared to do that, when they are, they are scared to engage with the material. But it's not their fault, right? Like what we have to understand is that we have literally created these human beings to walk and talk and go through all the motion, <laughs> but not necessarily stop and really really engage with the content, right? Really think, just really think about it. In, in a society where everything is so fast paced, mm -hmm. I mean, when, when do we have the time? Even if we wanted to, when do we have the time? And so I want my classroom to be that time, you know? And we can do both. We can, we can introduce some concepts and then we can spend a whole lot of time figuring out how they apply to you how they apply to the family structure, how do they apply to your social group, your larger society, the country, the world. Like, that's the goal. So do you find yourself, because you're really talking about helping the students to become critical thinkers mm -hmm. in the various topics that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Do you find there's a major difference regarding generation or generational divergence where uh, you find yourself push and pulling in the same classroom, within the same hour, trying to get people to the same place of conversation? At times, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I find that more traditionally aged students are becoming more outspoken, whereas 10 years ago, I don't remember that being the case. Um, and I find more of our our non-traditional students, meaning those working adults, those folks who are coming back maybe for personal improvement, they, um, 
they are sometimes maybe even more hesitant than the traditionally aged students because they've got they've got all of this stuff rolling around in their head like I'm the oldest one in the classroom or you know you know what 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 can I really show what can I really speak to because I'm just now doing it whereas these are all 20 year olds in the classroom or when I when I speak to um, those more mature learners over and over again that is the message that I hear and so I really try to work with them whether it's in office hours or before or after class to say hey when we talked about this I kind of saw you perked up what were you thinking you know I try to snag them so that again it goes back to authenticity right if if they feel like that I genuinely want to hear what they're thinking maybe they'll be a little more comfortable to kind of pop into the conversation next time right the younger students kind of suffer from the same but opposite, uh, I'll say, uh, I almost want to say disorder, but it's not a disorder, <laughs> right? Um, in that they bring so much, they bring so much value to the table, but think about how as a society we treat our young people and how we try to shut them down so often, right? And so mm -hmm. they don't trust that their lived experience is valid enough to be discussed, right? They don't trust that the things that they've seen is another way to see reality. And so it's really trying to give them the confidence, the um, encouragement to, to do exactly that, right? A couple of weeks ago, Dr. Uh, Oaks, Professor Oaks, uh, shared this article with me and the article was really about culture of caring. Mm. And I can't think of the name of the institution right now, but they basically integrated a process or a model around culture of caring. And it really gets to what you're just saying, how, you know, let's not try to shut them down, but let's try to engage them on a level that they believe and know that we care for them. It's been authentic. I just worked with, I, I was just doing my second eat and greet where I, I have like five students, up to five students, uh, RSVP to meet with the president. And we do it virtually. But when they RSVP to do it, I actually send them a menu and then I send them through Hub, Grubhub or DoorDash. Okay. A, a lunch, right? So they can have the lunch at the same time I'm having lunch and we eat lunch and talk virtually, right? So it's eat and greet with the president. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great experience for me. And during the second time around when I've done the eat and greet, one of the students literally said to me that she loves it when the instructor cares and when she believes the instructor cares about her uh, and about you know her work because life gets in the way and things get in the way and she wants to have that one-on-one -on -one connection to be able to ask questions because she was struggling some online but she says she struggled less if they found a way to talk to the instructor directly office hours and other ways and it, it just brought back to my remembrance this culture of caring right and if we if all of us had more of that mentality right the culture of caring uh, maybe our persistence rates retention rates completion rate would even be better than what they are now you know so so I appreciate you just sharing that uh, another question I have for you what is your favorite subject to actually teach within sociology? Ooh. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> okay. So it's not a subject per se. Uh-huh. It is a theory. Okay. So my favorite theory is symbolic interactionism. And within symbolic interaction theory, what we explore is how we use symbols and language um, and agreed upon meanings of those symbols 
to communicate with one another and how that impacts interaction, right? I tend to focus on language in my own studies. I'm absolutely fascinated by it. I am 100% enamored with how we use language to construct reality, right? And so when we, for instance, take a look at um, how words can change in meaning over time and the impact that those words have, right? When we talk about building students up or kind of shutting them down, how we're able to use language with that. Or when I'm, uh, when we're talking about the socialization process in class and we're talking about how we learn the things that we believe to be true, what messages did we receive, um, either explicitly or implicitly, through our constructed meaning, right, through the symbols in our world, to, to help us to know that these things are in fact true. When we talk about um, the power of, of language as far as, you know, building, for instance, in my race and ethnic class, um, building and maintaining positive or negative race relations and those societal structures that will help support it. You know, to what extent do, do symbols impact that? I, if, if we could have a class just on symbolic interactionism, I would teach it right now. <laughs> there should be a whole degree. Be a hard sell, but I think we could get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that uh, with me. Yeah. And as you can see, uh, what I believe to be true is that Suzanne Miller is a dynamic faculty member who continues to provide a culture of caring within the classroom. Uh, and when it comes to students' identities, when it comes to students having a sense of belonging, uh, when it comes to providing quality student engagement, it's critical that we find ways to do that in the classroom to build up students' confidence to allow students to experience success in the classroom. And I believe that if we continue to do that, that we will continue to see an increase in our completion rates in our persistence rate, in our retention rates. So there you have it, another episode of Perk Up with Dr. Spearman. And uh, I thank you for listening, and I thank our faculty member, Suzanne Miller, for her uh, engagement and her willingness to share from her lens. Thank you, and have a great day.